the last couple of years, I've been kind of uh, thinking about my own understanding of Wing Chun and, and trying to figure out how to kind of formulate it into a framework that, that makes sense to me. So basically, how do I, how do I compile what I've learned from Ken and, and others, um, mostly Ken though, obviously, um, into, into something that, that, uh, that, that I can explain, um, that, that's easy for people to get. Because what, what, I, what I've observed is I've you know, tried to share the information, tried to share um, the knowledge I have. Um, and and I, I historically have done it in a very piecemeal way. And, and when I explain things, and I kind of hold somebody's hand and I show it to them, they get it. And then it doesn't stick. And I've been trying to figure that out. Why doesn't it stick? Um, and I think ultimately what I, what I concluded was that uh, it needs to fit together in a way that people understand and can actually work on. Because it's, it's, you know, it's easy to, to kind of do something when somebody's holding your hand and explaining one technique or a principle or things like that. But as soon as you walk away, there's, there's a million other things for you to focus on and to worry about. And then it's, it's very easy for you to just forget that thing. So if, if, if things fit together in, in kind of a, a more holistic framework, um, kind of, you know, what I'm hoping is that you, it gives you a roadmap of, of you know, with how to, uh, you know, what to train and what to develop and things like that. Anyways, so that, that would have been the topic of the workshop had I come over this weekend, actually, uh, to show you guys and show you that framework. So unfortunately, I can't show you that framework. Um, so hopefully maybe in the summer when things cool down, uh, we can do so. But as a part of that kind of, um, this, I wouldn't say discovery, as a part of that effort, I've come to think a lot about, you know, the kind of just learning about learning, right? And, and I think that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, I can't promise that this will be useful or, for, for, you know, improve your wing turn. I, I hope it's at least interesting. Um, but uh, to the extent that it is interesting and it helps you kind of think about your training um, and, you know, and... I'm happy to have uh, follow-up discussions um, if you guys have questions. Um, and think, and like, so without further ado, let me just switch over and just do a presentation. I actually prepare a slide deck, um, not because, wow. not because uh, I particularly like slide decks, but it's it's it helps me um, kind of organize my thoughts. So it's it's essentially a form of writing for me. So let me do that. Alan, can I ask a question before you do the slides? Sure. Uh, is it all right if we have copies of these slides, or are you? Trying to keep them to yourself at this point. No, no, no. It's information is yeah. I, 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 I. So I'll oh, share. Sure. I just want to make sure it wasn't proprietary in your concern. No, about no, no, that. no. Okay. No, no, no. Yeah. All right. Can you guys see? Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So feel free to just uh, interrupt with any questions. Jump in. Um, ask me for clarification. Um, some of this might be abstract. I apologize for that. That's kind of how my brain works. Um, but uh, hopefully it makes sense. So let me let me just go ahead and start. Um, so, you guys can still see my screen? I mean, yeah. The full screen. yeah. Okay. Good. Yep. So, I'll be talking about knowledge, essentially, the types of knowledge, um, how, how, why this knowledge is uh, intransmissible, and how do, you figure, how, how do you figure that out despite it being intransmissible? Okay. So, this is just the teacher's knowledge space, everything the teacher knows, um, you know, not to scale, obviously. All knowledge <laughs> is it's outside. This triangle is the all of the teacher's wing to knowledge. Okay, and if we break it down further, um, I can break it down to multiple layers. So there's different types of knowledge. On the bottom, there's this unconscious knowledge, stuff that the teacher is doing, but they don't articulate, or they, they may not even be conscious of. Um, and these are things that they do that they don't speak about. If you pay close attention, you might pick up. You might not know why they're doing what they're doing, but they're doing it, so it's unconscious. Then a uh, layer above that is the unarticulate knowledge. These are knowledge, this is knowledge that they are um, conscious of, but maybe not well articulated. So I, I, I don't know why it works, but at least can maybe show you a technique, you know, given A, do that, given, given uh, technique A, do technique B, given technique B, do technique C, things like that. And then a uh, layer above that uh, is what I call principal knowledge. So this is where, uh, it's not just about the techniques they understand the print they, they're able to articulate the principles underlying that technique right and and this is where where you know, if you're a good teacher most of your content should be uh, most of your knowledge should be and then and then holistic knowledge is basically how do all these principles fit together so it's not just a, a loose collection of um, you know or, or, or you know kind of uh, it, how do how do these fit together into a framework holistically so 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 you can you know understand how 
uh, you can use it to basically understand uh, the rest of your wing chun. Um, this knowledge is rare, obviously, and it takes a, a long time to acquire. And um, it, it takes a pretty special person to kind of put things together to kind of you know explain in a way holistically, right? And and um, not many teachers can do this. Does this make sense? This breakdown? Yes. Yeah. Very much so. Yep. yep. Okay. All right. So um, I'm I'm. Right, right now, just setting context right now. Um, so uh, the interesting stuff is coming, uh, hopefully. Um, let me switch to, okay, so this is just a way to just understand that, you know, the triangle sizes are different. Obviously, there's a, uh, you know, a very shallow understanding on the left and, you know, profound understanding on the right. So I won't be talking about comparative uh, depth of knowledge, but, you know, the size of the triangle uh, is different from teacher to teacher. Um, then in terms of how good a teacher is, um, there's also a difference. So kind of the ratios between these levels are different. So like on the upper left hand corner, you have a proficient practitioner, but maybe not a good teacher. A lot of their knowledge is kind of unconscious uh, or unarticulated. Um, and on, on the, uh, you know, on the right side, upper right hand side, you have your average ma master where they have kind of a, kind of a balance, um, but then maybe very little holistic knowledge. As I said, mentioned before that that's rare. A true master should have a significant portion of their knowledge uh, in a kind of uh, well-articulated holistic framework, and uh, a generational master. It's it's you know it's kind of like one one of those one of those masters who kind of really move the art forward. That they can basically um, you know kind of tie everything together. They they are very rare, kind of like once in a generation type thing. So these are the type of teachers who like. Uh, contribute to like the Tai Chi classics, for example, right? So, so you know, somebody who can do this is is really pushing the art forward. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. Any questions so far? So no, hopefully it's pretty straightforward. Okay. Great. Yep. All right. So now let's get into the meat of things. Uh, so ideally, I as a student want to acquire all of my teacher's knowledge, right? So I want the red triangle. Um, that that's the sum of all of Ken's knowledge, for example. Um, Realistically, I can only, it's not possible. So my best case uh, knowledge acquisition is some subset of my teacher's knowledge, right? And the reason is because the, uh, the transmission of that knowledge is imperfect. And my, my own capacity to, to uh, understand or you know, to, to, to receive that knowledge is also imperfect. So you're never gonna get 100%, all right? I hope that's pretty obvious. Mm -hmm. It's actually much worse than that. Because um, depending on the type of student you are, how mindful you are with your training, it's, it's a much smaller subset than that. So if you look at your kind of typical unmindful student, somebody who just, you know, just practices by rote and doesn't really think too much about what they're doing, aren't are kind of self-reflective, uh, self um, or were somebody who, who, you know, kind of, you know, the kind of the Sifu says kind of student, um, they will get a very small portion of it because number one, they won't you know, they won't get the stuff that's unspoken, right? Because they're, they're just kind of either not thinking about it or just, just, uh, just focus on a very small subset of what Sifu says. Um, they may be able to get some principal knowledge, whatever the teacher talks about, but because they're so focused or not paying attention, um, you know, they don't, they don't, a lot of the kind of the advanced stuff goes over their head and a lot of stuff that's not articulated will also, um, you know, they don't, they don't get the whole picture. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, any questions so far? Good, okay. Um, a mindful student should get more of it, right? Um, this is just comparative. So the, if they're paying attention, they're thinking about what they're doing, um, they're trying to pay attention to everything that teacher says and does, um, they should get more of it. Um, and, and the unconscious stuff is, you know, they'll, they'll probably just get, get through osmosis over time. Okay, and for the, quote unquote, generational student, um, this student is able to get much more of it. Now, getting 100%, as I said, was in, is impossible, but it is possible to get uh, more than average. Um, and as a result of kind of exploring your boundaries and pushing your boundaries, you actually get a different uh, triangle. Um, so, so the question is, you know, how do you get that? Now, by the way, as an example, I, I personally consider Ken, uh, maybe, maybe if the, if the regular triangle is Lung Sao, sorry, yeah. is Lung Sao, um, this dotted blue line might be Ken's knowledge, right? right. The, the, I hope that makes sense, right? Because uh, you, you can all tell that Ken does something pretty unique and pretty special and, and pretty, you know, different from his, even his peers. Um, and he's gotten, you know, 
arguably a, a lot of long source knowledge, but it's, it's, it's definitely not the same triangle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so yeah, then the whole question is, okay, well, we just said that, you know, that, that subset was the best case uh, scenario. How do you, how do you get this, you know, how do you get this red Delta? How do you fill in those gaps? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So, so more con contextual setting. I don't know if you guys, uh, Heard of this quote, but I've saw it in a T-shirt once, and I loved it ever since. Uh, Do not seek to follow in the footsteps of the wise; seek what they saw. Um, Atsuo Basho, who is a uh, haiku poet, um, I guess pretty fam famous. I, I don't know much of his work, but I love this quote. Okay, uh, so here's where I get a little bit of abstract. Uh, please bear with me. I, I, I'm an engineer, so um, you know, for for whatever that's worth. Um, so here's one way to think of knowledge. Um, uh, here, what we have is a three-dimensional shape projected onto a two-dimensional plane, right? So what we have essentially is a cube projected onto a flat two-dimensional surface, right? Uh, another way to think of it is that basically I have higher order information here. And as I project that information to a lower dimensional uh, plane, I, I lose information, I flatten it out. And if you, if you were to try to infer the shape of this three-dimensional shape just by looking at the 2D drawing, um, and if you, if you don't know what a cube is, if you've never seen a cube before, trying to infer what that shape is, is really hard to do just by looking at the, at the two-dimensional shape. Does that make sense? Yes. Uh, right. well, to me, it does. I shouldn't speak for others. Yeah. Uh, other guys, can you chime in? Let me know if, if this makes sense so far. Yeah. Yeah? yeah. Yep. Yep. So, yep. so, so uh, what this means is that, um, so, so, uh, if, if we make things more complex, if this, this shape wasn't a cube, it, it was some kind of arbitrary 3D shape, let's say a mug or a house plant or whatever. If I try to project a house plant onto a flat surface and not tell you it's a house plant, you're gonna have a really hard time trying to figure out you know, what, that, what that 3D shape is. You know, I'd have to rotate the house plant and you, know, you have to see a lot of different examples of it to try to piece things together in your head, right? Um, what's worse, if it's not a 3D object, if it's a 4D object or a 5D object, then trying to understand that from a 2D uh, projection is even more challenging, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of trying to set up the analogy where the, the, the knowledge that a teacher has is multidimensional and is complex. The transmission, our ability to, to kind of uh, understand that knowledge is through a very limited bandwidth, which is essentially, you know, a couple hours of, uh, or a few hours a week uh, through the spoken language. Um, so trying to understand the teacher's knowledge through kind of a very limited uh, bandwidth, which is represented by this 2D, 2D plane, is very challenging and takes a lot of time. And, you know, Wing Chun knowledge, in my opinion, uh, or any, any skill actually, is, is very highly dimensional, right? So some just examples, and maybe not good examples, but still some examples of kind of different dimensions are, you know, in a, any particular situation, you know, when do I turn? When do I not turn? How long can I afford to wait? Uh, how much power should I use in this circumstance? How much energy is my opponent giving me? How stiff or soft is he? How, how much reach do they have? How much strength do they have? These are, all, these are all kind of factors that weigh into, in a given situation, what should I do? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes. And, and so, so the knowledge of all of this is, you know, largely unconscious. Um, but, you know, when you present Ken with, not, with, a, with a circumstance, you know, given some fixed value for all of these questions, he will have an answer. Um, can he articulate, you know, how he came up with that answer? Um, it, probably not. It, it's going to be very challenging, right? And so your ability to kind of understand this knowledge um, that Ken has, um, given the, the limited amount of time you have to practice, given how much time, you know, you have with Ken, um, in your guys' case, it's, it's more limited, obviously. Um, you know, given whatever language or cultural context, given your learning capacity, um, all of those are very kind of uh, hard constraints of, uh, on your ability to kind of uh, understand, you know, Ken's triangle. Make sense? Yes. Yeah. So unfortunately, uh, the conclusion is the 100% transmission is impossible. Right. And I, I think this is pretty obvious, but I just want to make that clear. It's uh, I, I worry when I hear a lot of people kind of stick to uh, to uh, literally to, to what Sifu says, you know, well, Ken says to do this or Ken says to do that or, oh, no, 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 that, that's incorrect because Ken says, you know, you have to lower your horse or raise your horse. I'm, I'm obviously not discounting what Ken says, but the, the if you just focus on what he says or any teacher says, you're going to get a very small subset of that knowledge. Right. And, and so the question of how you can actually get more of that triangle um, 
the second conclusion is you actually have to reconstruct that knowledge yourself. You have to rebuild that knowledge yourself given the limited capacity uh, of, of the transmission medium. Okay, you guys with me so far? Yes. All right. Yeah. Okay, so now the question is, how do you actually fill in those gaps? How do you reconstruct that knowledge? So I'm going to go through some simple examples. Um, a typical model building loop um, is, you know, I observe a given situation, I invoke some action, um, and hopefully with a prediction, you know, given the situation, I do this, and if I do this, this should, I should get this result. And then you observe that reaction, right? And what should happen is that you learn from it. So if I were to break it down, um, when I invoke uh, an action, so th this thing on the right just represents an abstract multi-dimensional model. Um, this is the best I can find in, on Google. But anyways, you use your knowledge base, right? Ken likes to call this a, a knowledge base or a database or whatever you want to call it. And you use that to make a prediction. So this make a prediction is actually pretty important. And, and this observing action, um, uh, observing reaction is also very important. And so when you observe the reaction, you, you know, if, if the prediction is correct, great, you reinforce the model. If it's not correct, then you correct the model, right? This, this seems very, very obvious, right? Um, hopefully it's not confusing. But what I see a lot of students do is they, you know, it's either one of a couple of scenarios. They just, they just do it. They just practice. They sit there and they do their set. They don't really think about it. And you can tell that their mind is blank, right? They're not working towards anything. So, so what happens to the learning? What happens to the model building? So showing up and putting your time just by itself is not enough, right? You, you, have, to, you have to go through that loop. Another very common scenario is um, ego-based training. I, I do something. I do an action because I want to win. And I observe the reaction. Did I win? Great. I'm awesome. If I didn't win, oh, I suck, or oh, he's using too much strength, or that's not when you or that was a cheap shot. Okay, that's fine, but where's the learning and where's the model building, right? Hopefully this is not, not uh, alien to you guys. I'm, I'm certainly guilty of uh, both of those scenarios. No, I'm, I'm very grateful to you, Alan. I just want to interject right now because you are doing a super job of articulating <laughs> right, my, my understanding of what's going on uh, when people are practicing and trying to learn, it, yeah. it's probably very common to, you know, everybody here. Yeah. Um, and their yeah. observation. So this is beautiful. I agree. <laughs> this, is the, this is the struggle. And uh, years ago, we were, uh, Kathy, Joe, and I borrowed from a, a Tai Chi book, right, to invest in loss. Uh -huh. Right. That, I mean, it's exactly this. Don't be worried about winning or losing and just try to be correct and figure out why it works or doesn't work. That's right. That's, that's exactly right. So that, so that's, so, you know, so hopefully those are familiar. And then, so, so the alternative of course is, is to actually train mindfully. And, and let me talk a little bit about what, what, what to me mindful training is. So um, in my experience and observations, I think it's best to pick one dimension to focus on at any one time. And that one time could be per session or per week or per month, hopefully something that's meaty. Um, I, I would not recommend training multiple things in one session because you know you, you just won't be able to move the ball forward. So that dimension could be, for example, your structure. Like I, I wanna focus on the stability of my structure. And that's the dimension I'm gonna focus on for this, for this training session or this week or this month. Um, and then, uh, obsessively monitor that one dimension for all of your training. So uh, when I'm doing my sets, when I'm working in the wall bag, when I'm doing my dummy, when I'm doing my drills, when I'm doing the, the qi sao, um, the, the one dimension that I'm gonna obsessively care about is my structure. How does this uh, training affect my structure? Is it more stable? Is it less stable? When I do this, how does it affect my, my center of balance, my balance? When my opponent is pushing hard, how does that affect my, my structure? When the opponent is not pushing hard, how does that affect my structure? So throughout all of your training, obsessively, you can monitor that one, one single dimension. Um, and this is key, and this is where most people fail, myself included, ignore your ego's BS. So as you're trying to work on that one thing, what's gonna happen is someone's gonna get a cheap shot in, right? Mm -hmm. Do you pay attention to that cheap shot? Or when I'm, when I'm focused on my structure and I think, hey, if I do it this way, I can get more power. And I start thinking about, you know, uh, kind of optimizing my power. That's also your ego's BS, right? Yeah, it's, it's easy to get distracted. Um, uh, it's, it's not unlike it for those of you who've done uh, meditation before, you know, trying to empty your mind or trying to focus your mind on one thing, um, then all sorts of other you know, BS comes up and, and all, all of a sudden you lose your uh, focus. It's the same thing as true when you're trying to learn. So as 
when you when you pick that one thing you want to work on, focus on that one thing, and all the expect that you're going to get distractions, whether from yourself or whether from other people. Um, your job is to ignore it and focus on that thing. And as as for for that duration you're focused on thing, put in the time. So it's 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 no good that you come in and say, okay, I'm going to focus on my structure, but I show for half an hour and I leave and I don't practice again for another two weeks. Then you're actually not going to get anything out of that, right? Um, so you need to put in enough time for whatever you're trying to practice and train to actually, you know, move the ball forward, right? And then you just repeat that process, right? You can pick another dimension next week. You can pick another dimension this week. But this is this is how you actually make progress along any of the dimensions you care about. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Any questions? No. This is great. Cool. Okay. Um, so let's let's take. Uh, a specific example and going back to our loop. So let's say that I want to focus on structure again, right? Um, so how would I do that in my normal training? So let's say I'm, I'm uh, in a chi cell session with somebody um, and I'm, I'm going to focus on structure today. So when I observe the situation, um, let's say that person is pushing on me. Um, when he's pushing on me, is my structure centered? Am I, am I balanced? Right? Am I, am I tense? Um, am I relaxed? Um, do, do I adhere to the five uh, guidelines that, that Ken uh, gives? Right, so where am I? How do I feel? Um, and, and am I centered? So what's the current situation? Then given that he's pushing on me, um, I can invoke an action. And invoke an action doesn't mean actually do something to the other person. It's any decision you make, actually. So in this case, let's say that uh, they're giving me energy. I'm going to... Uh, my decision, I'm going to try to receive the force into my knees. And if I do that correctly, I should be able to hold that, right? That's my theory. That's my hypothesis, right? And then let's see if that's true. So when I move my mind, uh, my intent into my knees to receive its force, what actually happens? One of two things can happen. Uh, either you're correct or you're incorrect, right? So if you're correct, hey, great. Uh, my, my hypothesis is correct. I should keep doing this. Um, I'm on the right track. Or if I'm incorrect, what was wrong? You know, in this case, maybe my hips were too tight, and as a result, it broke my structure. So um, the correction is, okay, next time I, I better try to relax my hips uh, when, when I try to absorb the, the force into my knees. And then you just repeat, right? And this, the important thing here is not the specific example. The important thing here is that you have this background learning thread that never turns off. It's constantly monitoring whatever you want to work on. And that makes sense. It, it's actually it's 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 meditative. You have to keep focus on this, and it's easy to forget about this. Uh, but you have to pay attention to whatever it is you're you're trying to train. There's no off switch. Is, is, is very important. Right. That makes sense, guys. Absolutely. It does. Okay. Yep. Good. Okay, so I think I'm coming up. Uh, I'm wrapping it up soon. Um, uh, Final couple slides. So phases of learning. So when I when I say all this stuff about model building and and not sticking with it, you know, not limiting yourself to what Stifu says, um, it's important to kind of put that into context. Um, I'm not saying go out and invent your new system. I'm not saying go out and and you know do something, learn Tai Chi unless you're really passionate about. It. There's nothing wrong with learning Tai Chi, but but don't. Don't go out and basically try to do everything all at once, right? There are multiple phases in, in learning. And, and at least in my personal experience, um, here are kind of the three major phases. You start out, you try to absorb as much as you can from your teacher. You try to learn mindfully. You try to put in the time. So when you're starting out, uh, it's not the time for you to basically try to incorporate Tai Chi into your Wing Chun. It's, it's time to basically, you have a teacher, a good teacher, which is really rare, um, um, Kathy, Joe, and Mark has a lot of knowledge that you know you should tr you guys should try to sponge as as much as you can, and and ch learn from the teacher, learn mindfully, put in time. Then over time, what you what you should try to do as you start kind of um, uh, getting more advanced into the teaching is try to pick out things that the teacher doesn't articulate. So th these are things that maybe your 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 teacher uh, doesn't articulate well because, you know, for a variety of reasons, or maybe there are things that they do that are effective, but, they, you know, they don't talk about. Maybe they're, they're not conscious about. Uh, and you want to observe that too. You want to learn from that as well, right? Um, so these days when I, when I uh, watch Ken, um, I'm, I'm, much, I'm watching what he does much more closely than what he says because, you know, the stuff he says over time, he just says the same thing. Um, he'll, 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 he'll uh, of course, phrase it differently as he learns, and that's great. But uh, by and large, the stuff he talks about uh, is stuff that you'll hear uh, before. So, um, you know, there's more to it, and, and 
and if you pay attention to what he does and under what circumstances he does things um, and the types of feedback he gets, you'll you'll start to absorb more. Okay, and then and then over time, when you go beyond that, um, it's 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 time to basically go beyond your teacher's understanding, not necessarily to learn um, you know something outside of that system, but give giving you a different perspective of what your teacher is teaching. So think of this as kind of uh, trying to understand that same knowledge, but from a different angle, right? So for example, um, I don't practice Trey Strunkin's method, but I watch a lot of uh, Nima King's videos and the stuff he articulates, uh, there's a lot of overlap with what Ken teaches. The, the way he, um, uh, what he does, you know, obviously you can tell it's different, but the conceptual models that he uses, the, the, the examples that he uses, um, if you try to understand the intersection of, uh, say, Nima and Ken, then that, that intersection is actually something that is um, true for both of them, right? And if you understand what that is, then you have a deeper understanding. Better yet, if you, you know, can, if you can see kind of commonalities between what Ken does and maybe some other Tai Chi teachers, um, like um, Chen Zhonghua or, or, or Adam Misner, if you can understand what the intersection is, then you, you've, you, you're able to touch on a more fundamental truth, if that makes sense. Right. So, so when you're going outside the system, going outside your teacher, I don't mean, you know, pick up, you know, all sorts of different arts and try to incorporate into your Wing Chun. What I mean is try to understand that knowledge that you have in, in your head from a different angle, a different perspective to give you a better understanding, a deeper understanding. Make sense? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'm sure a lot of you guys do this already. I'm just trying to just break it down. Um, so uh, this is how it works. So, okay. In, in summary, um, acquiring any Wing Chun or any skill is a highly complex process. process. That's fine. Uh, the whole of the knowledge is much greater than what's typically articulated or observed. So, you know, what, what you learn in class, what your teacher says, it's just a very small subset of it. It's your job to, to formulate your own knowledge model by discipline, mindful training, right? So if you, if you stick with just what Sifu says, uh, you're gonna get a very small portion of it. Uh, it's your job to basically be very active and very mindful. It's, it's, it's hard work. Um, it takes a lot of uh, brain power. And then uh, you need to optimize your learning, right? You start out with maximizing what you learn from your teacher. Then over time, you can go deeper by observing uh, your teacher's unarticulated knowledge, what they, they, they don't say. Um, and then over time, go beyond your teacher to understand that knowledge. So that's it. Hopefully that, that was interesting. <laughs>